Welcome everyone. This is class number 24 of the IBIS prep crash course for the July 2024 Florida bar exam. And we have two special guest lectures today, Marion and Emily, and we are doing family law. And um, Marion scored 90 on family law, which if you don't recognize, that's pretty much as high as you can possibly score. So you're um, getting advice and information from an expert who performed as recently as a year or so ago. So this is fresh in her mind and she scored super high. And as I told the class last time, all of her students that worked with her one-on-one -on -one passed the exam in February. So she has about as good of a track record as you could possibly have. And then Emily is another one of our great instructors who has experience in family law. And she also did amazing on the test and has amazing results with her students. So we couldn't be more excited for their presentation. And I'm gonna let these amazing women take it away. Awesome, thank you, Andrew, so much for that introduction. And I was here last week and I'm really glad to be back again. Um, love that I get to do this. And this time around with my law school bestie, Emily, we collabed on this one. Um, and we actually both did all our pro bono hours in family law court. Um, so family law is very special to both of us. Um, we did all of law school together. We studied for the bar exam together. And now we're tutoring and, and doing classes together, um, which uh, unrelated to family law, but just as a general exam tip, life tip, um, going through the bar exam is obviously a, you know, it's a tough process. I know you all feel me on that. And having a friend there for you who is going through the same thing, also going to take the bar or has taken it in the past is such a game changer, um, keeps your mental health in check. You keep each other accountable. So, you know, you're in such a good position because you guys have the ability to see um, all your classmates, you know, week after week and go through this kind of interactive course with IBIS, um, which is not something that, you know, we necessarily had, but we had each other. So friends are a really, really good resource during this time. Um, so definitely take advantage of your friends who are also going through the same thing because it's it's so, so helpful. Um, but without further ado, let's get into family law. Um, so family law is going to be part of section A of the bar exam. If it does get tested, it's going to be tested exclusively in essay format. Um, and let me just, all right, is my, is my screen switching? Can we see the yeah. family law topics? Okay, cool. All right. So these are basically the topics that they can test you on, on an essay. So people love getting family law essays because they tend to be a little bit more straightforward, simple, fact specific, and there's really limited things that they like to test on, right? Um, and that's really what these topics here are. Uh, we're going to look at jurisdictional issues of the court today. We're going to look at divorce, uh, marital agreements, equitable distribution, alimony, all the topics having to do with children, um, and then adoption. So family law has a lot of little acronyms um, that people use to kind of make their life easier, remember all these little topics. One of them is PEACE. Um, and PEACE stands for parental responsibility, equitable distribution, alimony, child support, and then the E is everything else, right? Including attorney's fees. Um, so this is a really good acronym to kind of guide you through any family law problem, any family law essay that you can get on the bar exam. So just starting off very, very generally, we got to talk about what marriage is in the first place, because in order to get divorced, you got to get married first, right? So we can think of marriage as kind of like a civil contract. Um, but unlike other traditional contracts, a marriage can only be terminated by the state, right? There needs to be some sort of judicial adjudication to terminate a marriage. Um, and as far as a valid marriage, this isn't super tested. However, um, it may come up. It may be one of those mini issues that comes up in an essay. And all you have to know are the three C's for some extra points there, right? So there's three C's for 
what is considered a valid a valid ceremonial marriage in Florida. The first C, easy enough consent, right? And that just means that there's no fraud, no misrepresentation, no mistake, and no duress when it comes into entering into a marriage, going through with the marriage, right? We think of kind of standard contract defenses almost. Um, the second C is capacity, right? Again, pretty common sense. So capacity is going to refer to mental capacity um, of the parties, meaning they are capable of understanding the nature of the act of marriage. Um, the parties can't be already married to somebody else. Um, age, right? So usually got to be 18. However, there is a little nuance in Florida that a 17 year old can get validly married um, as long as they have the consent of the parents or the legal guardian and the other party to the marriage is not more than two years older than the minor, right? So that would be a max age of 19. Um, also part of capacity is that they are not too closely related by blood, right? So that means no full or half blood relatives, no lineal descendants, right? No kind of incest in Florida, even though, weirdly enough, first cousins can legally marry in, Flor in Florida. I know, weird, but we all know Florida can be a little backwards at times. Um, and then the very last uh, C is compliance with formalities. So there's certain formalities that you need to go through when you get married. Um, one of them being a marriage license. You need to apply for a marriage license. There's going to be a three-day waiting period before you actually get that license. Um, and once you have that license and you do get married, um, there needs to be solemnization by a judge, a political official, or some other clergy where they will basically just certify the marriage license within 10 days of the marriage actually taking place. Um, so those are the three C's that make up a valid ceremonial formal marriage in Florida. Um, that's usually how it should go. Now, sometimes we have what's called a common law marriage and informal marriage, meaning they didn't really follow the three C's, right? One of those things may be missing. Um, common law marriages are abolished in Florida, but if there is a common law marriage prior to 1968, Florida will recognize it as valid. And of course, um, they will recognize common law marriages from another state just pursuant to the full faith and credit clause. Um, and some factors to kind of look for there, um, to look for the validity of an informal common law marriage include consent, capacity. So that'll just be the same consent and capacity we just spoke about, but also the conduct of the parties if they hold themselves out as being married um, and cohabitation. So cohabitation won't only refer to just living together, but the court will also look to other things such as um, if they have, um, you know, joint bank accounts, mutual funds, things of that nature, right? Um, but basically just look for if they hold themselves out as a married couple and act like a married couple would act. Um, again, these things are not highly tested, but it may come up as a minor issue. Um, and they're so easy to learn that I know you can all get them down in a couple of minutes and that'll be some extra points should this issue pop up on an essay. So jurisdiction and divorce. When we talk about jurisdictional issues in family law, we can be referring to jurisdiction um, when it comes to divorce and then jurisdiction for proceedings having to do with children. Um, Emily's going to talk a little bit about the jurisdiction when it deals with children involved in a divorce proceeding. Um, but the initial jurisdiction issue always, always, always has to be um said and addressed in a family law essay and i always recommend kind of starting with the jurisdictional issue first um because a court can't hear a case if it doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction over it um so learning the jurisdiction rules um when it comes to divorce proceedings is key so as far as divorce itself Florida is known as a no-fault state when it comes to divorce. Um, basically, what that means is that nobody really needs to have done anything wrong 
for divorce to happen, right? We really just need to show one of two grounds. The first one and the highly tested one is that the marriage is irretrievably broken. And in order to show that, you just need testimony from at least one spouse stating that the marriage is irretrievably broken, right? That can just be stated on the petition for divorce. Um, that is the highly tested one. The second one, not really tested too much, but might as well know it, can throw it in there for an extra point, is mental incapacity for at least three years, meaning one of the spouses must be adjudicated mentally incompetent at least three years prior to filing. So those are going to be your only two grounds uh, for divorce in Florida. Pretty broad, pretty general, um, no fault needed. And the only defenses to a divorce are denial of these grounds, meaning a spouse will say, well, the marriage is not irretrievably broken, right? That's usually what will happen if the divorce is contested. So if the divorce is uncontested, there is no denial of the grounds, or in a case where parties are seeking to divorce and there are no minor marital children between the spouses, a judgment of dissolution of marriage has to be entered, right? So that divorce is going to go through if this divorce is uncontested, so no one's contesting it, spouses agree that the marriage is irretrievably broken, um, and slash or there are no minor marital children, right? Divorce is going to go through. Now, more common situation is that divorce is either contested um, or there are minor marital children between the parties, right? So in that case, the court is not going to just automatically enter a judgment of dissolution of marriage or automatically consider that. Um, we kind of have to consider other things, right? So they're really going to have three options here. They can continue proceedings for up to three months for reconciliation between the spouses. Um, they can order the spouses to go to counseling or they can order whatever other conduct is considered in the best interest of the children, right? So if you get a question where the divorce is contested or there are minor children, all you have to do is just mention those three avenues that the court can take. As far as the jurisdictional issues of the court, the circuit court, the circuit family court needs to have both subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction over the proceeding and the parties, right? Just like in any case. So the personal jurisdiction, uh, you don't really need to get into it in a family law problem, right? It's not usually an issue that is going to be tested there. But if it is, it's going to be the same analysis that you would use in a civil case, right? It's just going to focus on the spouses or the individual's contacts with the state, with Florida, right? Um, as far as subject matter jurisdiction, the very specific, very easy rule to know is that one spouse must be a resident of Florida for at least six months before commencing the divorce action. Or if that's not true, the court will consider a party's intent to make Florida their principal residence and the reasons for the absence. So um, one of the essays that I read when I was studying for the bar and practicing for the bar was about one spouse that had lived in Florida for only three months before they initiated divorce proceedings. But the reason for that was that they were in the military and they were moving all over. They had just retired and they had just bought a home in Florida and had lived there for three months, right? They don't meet that six month requirement, right? They're three months shy of that. However, um, the court considered the party's intent to make Florida their residence, right? Well, I'm buying a home. Um, I'm I'm making, you know, I'm opening a bank account here. I'm doing all of these things. I'm registered to vote here. Um, and the reasons for the absence was, well, I was in the military. My job required me to move around, right? So it's going to be either or. As long as you can either show six months of residency or make the argument, then you're good and subject matter jurisdiction will be met. So let's talk a little bit about marital agreements. So everyone knows prenups, everyone knows um, that term. 
Premarital agreements or prenups are agreements that are entered into uh, before and in contemplation of marriage between prospective spouses, right? So this happens before they are actually married. Um, and Florida follows what is the majority um, rule, and it's called the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act. And basically what that states is that any prenup agreement, any premarital agreement has to be in writing and signed by both parties, right? And if you know anything and remember anything about the statute of frauds is the M in the my legs, which is kind of the common little acronym there. The first M is for marriage, right? So contracts made in contemplation of marriage, um, such as a premarital agreement, have to be in writing, have to meet. Uh, the requirements of the statute of frauds. So prenups got to be in writing, got to be signed by both parties. They're going to be effective upon the date of marriage. Um, so premarital agreements can discuss the division of property, um, alimony, and attorney's fees upon divorce. What it cannot do is adversely affect the right of a child to receive support, child support, um, or definitely dictate parental responsibilities upon separation or divorce. So a lot of things as between the spouses themselves or the people who are going to get married themselves can be figured out in a prenup agreement, um, but the court is very, very sensitive as to um, coming into separate agreements about child support um, and child responsibilities. And that's because child support, and Emily will get more into this, but child support um, and everything kind of related to children is the right of the children, not the right of the parents, right? It's the rights of the children. Um, so that's why the court tends to be a little bit sensitive about that. So any post-marital amendments or revocations of a prenup are permitted, but they are going to be permitted only by a signed written agreement. So no oral stuff, got to be a signed written agreement. And premarital agreements are not going to be enforceable if its execution was involuntary, the product of fraud, duress, coercion, overreaching, um, or it was unconscionable. And what that means in this context is one party didn't receive a full and fair disclosure of um, somebody else's, you know, the other party's uh, financial obligations, financial situations, their assets, things like that. Um, again, think of this as kind of a contract, right? We're looking at standard contract defenses here. So that is a prenup, again, before and in contemplation of marriage, but we also have post-marital agreements or post-nups. Um, so post-marital agreements are agreements made between spouses during the actual marriage. So they're actually not going to be subject to the statute of frauds unless the subject of the agreement falls within the statute of frauds, something like the transfer of real property. Practically, they probably will be in writing, but just know that it's not really necessarily a requirement. So post-marital agreements, again, they can limit or even preclude spousal support, alimony, um, and they can also address certain ma certain uh, topics of child support or parental responsibility. But again, they cannot adversely affect the child's right to child support or firmly determine um, parental responsibility. And they can never, ever limit or preclude child support. Again, that's going to be something that is determined by the court. Um, we also have separation agreements. So a separation agreement is made between a married couple planning for divorce, and it's generally going to be merged into the final judgment for divorce, as long as it's based on a full and fair disclosure. So again, Separation agreements are going to deal with things like the division of property, um, alimony, things like that. So equitable distribution is definitely something that you need to know for family law. It's probably going to be a part of any single essay that you put together for family law. 
Um, Florida is an equitable distribution state when it comes to divorce. So what this means is that the court will divide marital property in a fair and equitable manner at divorce. So that doesn't necessarily mean a 50-50 split, right? A 50-50 might be the starting point, but it's going to depend on a lot of factors between the parties as to what is fair and what is equitable. It's not equal distribution, it's equitable distribution. So family law tends to be very fact-specific and factor heavy, which is why it's one of those subjects that has so many acronyms with it. Um, so learning these factors is really, really important when it comes to family law. The good thing is that a lot of these are kind of common sense, and they make sense just across the board when dealing with divorce, um, child issues, all that kind of stuff. A lot of these factors are the same or similar. So some of the factors that we need to consider regarding equitable distribution are the length of the marriage. So how long were these parties married for? The economic circumstances of each spouse, um, the contributions of each spouse during the marriage. So that includes things like homemaking and child rearing and child care. Um, the contributions to the education of the other spouse, right? Maybe one spouse, um, you know, worked two jobs to put the other spouse through law school. Um, interruptions to a spouse's career or education, right? Maybe uh, somebody was a doctor, then they decided to have kids and they kind of had to wanted to take a break from working to raise their children. Those things will be taken into consideration. Um, retention of the marital residence for children. So this is a big one that comes up. A lot of the times in these uh, divorce scenarios, there will be obviously a marital home and there will be minor children. And whoever is staying with the children will argue that they should get the house so that the children can live there. Um, and then the catch-all is any other factors the court finds necessary and just. So any other factor the court finds necessary and just should just tell you that family law, again, is a very fact-specific subject. So when you're going through an essay, you know, really make note of everything that they're telling you about the husband, everything that they're telling you about the wife, right? Their jobs, their economic circumstances, if they had to give anything up to help the other person out. All of those little things really do matter um, when we're talking about things like equitable distribution. So one thing that I want to harp on is that the court will divide marital property, right? Meaning we need to be able to characterize what is marital property and therefore property that is subject to equitable distribution and what is non-marital property, a uh, property that is not going to be subject to equitable distribution. So marital property is property that is acquired during the marriage. Um, again, this will be divided or allocated among the spouses through equitable distribution. Non-marital property is going to be property acquired before the marriage and after the marriage terminates, as well as property acquired by gift, uh, bequest, devise, or dissent. So Non-marital property will not be divided or allocated among the spouses through equitable property. When I say property acquired by gift, bequest, devise, or descent, that doesn't include gifts between spouses, right? Gifts between spouses during the marriage are considered marital property. So husband gives wife a diamond necklace during their marriage. Yes, it's a gift, but it's a gift between spouses. So that is going to be something that is considered marital property. Now, if your aunt gives you a gift during marriage, right, that's not going to be considered a uh, marital property, right? That's going to be considered non-marital property. So it's really important to just know the distinction between those two because it will let you know what is subject to equitable distribution and what's not subject to equitable distribution, right? In a scenario, there's always going to be at least one piece of property that you're going to have to determine what it falls into and whether it will be part of your analysis. Um, and further into this, we have to talk about the characterization of specific property. So there is something called active appreciation in family law, 
and it refers to the appreciation um, in value of non-marital property. So active appreciation. And again, that, ref that refers to the enhanced value of non-marital property. Um, that is the result of the efforts of a spouse or a contribution from marital property. So example, uh, you inherit a beach house from your deceased aunt and you use marital property such as mutual funds to improve the beach house. This is active appreciation, right? Generally, if you um if you get something by devise or descent or bequest or gift again that's not going to be considered marital property that's non-marital property um, um yes I mean, um doing amazing and can't wait to learn more about appreciation active and passive but we did have a question a couple jokes yeah. but one actual question um let's see erica's asking are there different rules for family heirlooms did you want to elaborate on that erica yeah, when we were talking about the gifts during marriage and that they're marital gifts, and you said that, you know, that's subject to equitable distribution. If it's, let's say, the husband has like a necklace that belongs to his grandmother, do they have different rules for family heirlooms that are gifted to the spouse during a marriage? So is the, and I'm just going to ask you so that I can be clear, is the husband acquiring this and keeping it for himself, or are they then gifting it to the spouse? So let's just say like the husband got, you know, he he has his grandmother's necklace and he gives it to his wife as a gift for their wedding anniversary. Got you. But it is a family heirloom. Got you. Okay. So originally, let's just say that first transfer, right? That first kind of device or bequest, however it came about to the husband originally, that itself wouldn't be considered marital property, right? So if they were then to divorce, um, that's not going to be part of the analysis of equitable distribution, right? That's not going to be a piece of property there. However, if the husband gave the gift, no matter how he acquired it, if he did give it uh, to the other spouse as a gift, that there can at least be an argument, right, that that's marital property. So if you have a situation that comes up like that, I would definitely just make the argument um, there that it could be considered marital property. Um, and it will likely be found marital property because it's a gift between spouses. Um, but that, that initial way that the husband got it, th that itself wouldn't be, um, uh, marital property. If that makes sense. Is that good? Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. Was there another question, Andrew? I just want to make sure before I continue. Oh, perfect. Let's keep it moving. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so active appreciation. Um, and I'm I'm just gonna go through the example again. You inherit a beach house from your deceased aunt. Um, again, this isn't going to be considered marital property, right? Um, but one of the spouses uses marital property, such as mutual funds, to improve the beach house. That's what active appreciation is. Um, the enhanced value, right? So not necessarily the entire a value of the beach house itself, but how much it increased in value, that enhanced value would be considered marital property subject to equitable distribution. So it'll just be something that is taken into account when we're uh, determining equitable distribution. That's just something that you want to mention in the fact pattern. Um, we also have passive appreciation. So passive appreciation of non-marital property um, is considered non-marital property, right? And that just means the enhanced value um, of non-marital property due to market factors, right? So it's not really because of the other spouse's contribution or um, a contribution stemming from marital property. Um, it's just going to be market factors, right? Like inflation um, or other economic factors. And these are things that they're going to have to tell you in the fact pattern, right? Um, this beach house... Um, has an enhanced value due to inflation, right? Due to uh, the economy boost. They're going to have to tell you these fact patterns. You're not going to have to figure that out. Just know the difference between active appreciation and passive appreciation and how that changes um, the, the analysis for marital property and non-marital property. Um, also very important to know is things like retirement benefits, uh, pensions, military benefits, uh, if that accrued during the marriage, 
they are going to be considered marital property. Now, note that this doesn't include social security benefits, but retirement benefits, pensions, and military benefits are going to be considered marital property if they accrued during the marriage. So I think the big thing here is to watch out for co-mingled assets. Um, so example of what that means. One spouse has a retirement account with funds that were acquired before the marriage, right? They started this retirement account with some funds before they got married. Um, the parties then get married and the retirement account grows in value during the marriage. Um, the funds earned before the marriage are going to be considered non-marital property. And only the funds accrued during the marriage are marital property. So let's say that, you know, this these military benefits or this military pension, whatever it may be, um, was in place for 20 years, right? Um, the first five years, husband was single, wasn't married. Uh, but then the next 15 years, he was married and now they're going through a divorce. Those first five years, that's going to be considered non-marital property. We're not going to take that into account um, for equitable distribution. However, the 15 years is going to be considered marital property because it's funds that accrued during the marriage. Um, so just watch out for commingled assets. Again, family law, very fact specific. Just make sure that you are making note of everything. Um, so our next um, section is alimony. And this is where I will go ahead and turn it over to my law school bestie, um, Emily. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and she will go ahead and pick up right here and talk to you guys about everything else you need to know about family law. Amazing. Um, before we do the transition, does anyone have any questions for Marion? Well, when you are so thorough and amazing, you leave the audience totally speechless. So let's continue <laughs> with the transition. I'm going to tell you. Perfect. Thank you, Marion, for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here and talk to you guys a little bit about uh, this family law world. So let me just go ahead and share my screen and we'll get the ball rolling on alimony. Alimony. No more permanent right. alimony. That is correct. Okay, so is everybody able to see my screen? Perfect. Okay, awesome. So the first thing with alimony that I want you guys to focus on, it's really, it, it just refers to the monetary obligation to provide the other spouse with support when such spouse cannot provide for their own needs. The focus on is the need versus the ability to pay. And what's important to note is the Florida Board of Bar Examiners are going to want you to really throw in those words and sprinkle that in your essays. So what is the need? And not only do we have the need, but does the other, the other spouse have the ability to pay? And another thing that we want to focus on is that either spouse is entitled to claim alimony. Doesn't necessarily mean that the wife can only claim it or the husband. So what does an example look like? So let's just say, for example, we have husband and wife and husband and wife are J-Lo and Ben Affleck. In that case, we have two famous celebrities who have a lot of money. In that situation, we're going to say, yes, they do have the ability to pay, but do they really have the need, right? Some would argue yes, some would argue no, but purposes of this example, we're going to say probably not. They don't have the need for alimony. So let's switch that over to individuals who are unable to pay. Let's just say husband and wife are both homeless. In that situation, you know, we will focus on that they do have the need for it, but does either spouse have the ability to pay? And that would likely be a no. So when the court looks to see whether they're going to award alimony, they're going to look at several factors. And those factors include, you know, uh, the standard of living established during the marriage. So how were the parties living at throughout the marriage? Were they living a luxurious life or were they kind of living the middle class life? They're going to take a look at that. Uh, the duration of the marriage. And I want to emphasize on that because that has changed in Florida and the Florida Board of Bar Examiners expect you to know those changes. And we'll discuss that a little bit more um, below. But also we'll look to see the age and condition of each spouse. What does that mean? How old are they? Are they going to be able to get employment? Are they going to be able to go back to school? Are they disabled? What is the condition of each spouse? 
the financial resources, what jobs do they work? Are they working at a restaurant? Are they lawyers? The earning capacities, educational levels, vocational skills, and employability, and the time necessary for each party to acquire qualifications to find appropriate employment. Contribution of each party to the marriage, including homemaking and child rearing care, meaning was it a stay-at-home mom um, or a stay-at-home dad, for that matter, right? Uh, the expected responsibilities for minor children in common. What are the party's responsibilities? Who takes the child to school? Who is the edu Who educates them at home? Who does homework with them? Who cooks? They're going to look at all those things. Um, and marital misconduct. This is something that has changed because now adultery may now be considered when determining alimony. That's a change that's been added factor. So the Florida Board of Bar Examiners are going to expect you to know that. And the biggest thing is the duration of the marriage. And why that's important is because that's also going to help us determine which type of alimony can be awarded. So what I want you guys to you know, emphasize on is short-term marriages has now changed to less than 10 years. Moderate-term marriages are more than 10, but less than 20. And now long-term marriages are more than 20. They're going to expect you to know those changes because that is something that has changed from before. What's happened is they've increased the amount of, of the terms of marriages. And as Andrew indicated earlier, permanent alimony is now abolished. And that's something that you really want to let the Florida Board of Bar Examiners know, hey, I know these changes in the term in the duration of marriage. And guess what? I know that permanent alimony has been abolished. So um, let them know that. Um, one thing Next. I was thinking about, and I just wanted to clarify. So permanent alimony has been abolished, but people who already were granted permanent alimony are grandfathered in. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. If, you know, they're not going to apply retroactively. If they've already been given uh, the permanent alimony in that situation, they are going to be grandfathered in because it was before uh, the changes that the legislator implicated. And again, you got to kind of think about this as a public policy consideration. Where do we live? We live in Florida, right? Uh, we want to make it a little bit harder for people to get that permanent alimony because in essence, it's just them, you know, having this money for the rest of their lives, arguably. So um, I have an acronym here that's called Pick Better Relationships, duh. And I love acronyms because it provides with an easier way to remember uh, the different types of alimony. So the pick, right, it's going to be for pendente lite, which is, it's a, uh, it's kind of Latin, right? Pending litigation, if you may. Uh, bridge the gap. And the R stands for rehabilitative and durational. And remember, permanent alimony, we're no longer, that's been abolished, okay? Um, so we'll start with the P, pendente lite. It just lasts from the separation to the divorce. And what's the important thing is that is this is during the litigation and during the divorce proceedings. So throughout that process, What's the point of this type of alimony? It's to put the parties on equal footing during the divorce proceedings. So notice how it's only throughout that time in litigation. And it's always available and cannot be contracted away. Earlier, Miriam was discussing about the marital agreements. And this is one of those things that we want to keep in mind that it's always available and you can't contract it away. All right. Um, now, it can be vacated and it can be modified or set aside for good cause by the court. So what does that mean? If a party wants to go ahead and issue, uh, seek a modification of it, they can, they can modify it, all right? So what I want you guys to keep in mind also is those distinctions of things that can be modified and those that cannot be modified. So the next one we have is bridge the gap. And let me just make sure I don't have any questions in my chat, okay. All right, no questions. Yeah, okay, sorry. perfect. All right, so um, bridge the gap, right? This is, and again, what's the biggest thing with the Florida Board of Bar Examiners is we want to focus on those numbers and those key buzzwords, right? Bridge the gap, it's allowed for a period of two years. And the purpose of this is, if you think about it, it's like a bridge. You mm -hmm. want to help the dependent spouse transition from a married life into being single. And this is for the specific short-term needs. So this one, it, uh, bridge the gap cannot be modified. So once the judge enters that order in, you can't change the amount of time or the amount of money that's been awarded. So essentially we think about this, right? Because when an individual becomes single, you kind of need two of everything. 
Uh, you need another home, you need two beds, you need furniture, right, from basic necessities. So the point of Bridge the Gap is to allow the individual to essentially transition from being married into single. And again, we want to focus on this is only allowed for a period of two years. So that's Bridge the Gap. We're going to move on to rehabilitative. So this is allowed for a limit. Sorry, we do have a question, Erica, a resident yes. question there, um, does, which is good, Erica. We, we love that. Does Florida allow the condition that the spouse that the spouse can't get remarried, and if they do, they automatically lose it in terms of alimony? So that's a good question. So, um, you know, that's definitely something that the other party would bring up to the court's attention, that they no longer have the need for it. Um, so, you know, for bridge the gap, probably not because it can't be modified. But if you have the other ones like pendente elite, that's a situation where you can bring it up to the judge. And again, the key words is there's been a substantial change in circumstances, which would allow for that modification. And the substantial change would be in that case, hey, they're no longer single. They probably don't have the need for it, right? Maybe the other party has the ability, but there's no longer the need because that you know other individual that they married has now changed their circumstances. But again, you know, you would argue, why don't they no longer have the need and what's been the substantial change in circumstances? All right. But you always argue for both. Does that help clarify the question on that one? Yeah, amazing. OK, perfect. All right. So back to rehabilitative again, five years. You want to let the Florida Board Bar examiners, hey, I know that it's only five years. So the purpose is what? To rehabilitate. We want to be able to make this person essentially independent. So make the spouse self-supporting with new education, with training or employment and help improve the earning capacity of the dependent spouse. But that's when we go back to the alimony factors. We wanna see, okay, how old are they, right? Because if, let's just say for example, husband is 75 years old, what education really can he get? He's not gonna go back to school and become a lawyer. I mean, maybe he will. But, you know, arguably, you'd say that at that point, he's an older gentleman, right? And, you know, getting new education or employment probably wouldn't be feasible for that individual. Um, so, again, really look to see those factors that we discussed earlier and kind of you do sort of a balancing. Look to see the situation of the, of, of the individuals and then you can kind of determine which one would be the best sort of alimony to award in that situation, if any. So the biggest thing with rehabilitative is that there must be a specific rehabilitative plan. It doesn't mean that the court's just going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to grant it. And, you know, you have these five years pretty much figured out, go to law school, go to fashion school, do whatever you want. That's not the case. There has to be a specific plan as to, OK, what is this individual going to do right to be able to become self-supporting? Are they going to go back to school? Are they going to start seeking jobs? Are they going to contact, for example, an employment agency to help them? What is the plan to rehabilitate them back and allow them to be self-supporting? Now, with this one, it can be modified if there is a change in circumstances or there's non-compliance with the rehabilitative plan or the rehabil rehabilitative plan finishes. So what does that mean? Um, husband says, I'm going to law school. I'm going to go. I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to take the bar exam. But then all of a sudden, he drops out, right? But the specific rehabilitative plan indicates that he must go to law school, and he doesn't. So in that situation, there has been noncompliance. Or let's just say the positive. He goes to law school. He passes the bar exam, right? In that situation, it was uh, three years that he went, and he passed within three years, which would be within the five-year uh, limit uh, period. So in that situation, the rehabilitative plan finished. So that's situations in which you want to keep in mind. Are there a substantial change in circumstances that we can modify this? Is there non-compliance? Are they not following the plan that was issued by the court? Or did it simply finish and now this, the spouse is able to be self-supporting? So that's what we want to think about with rehabilitative. Now, durational. <clears throat> durational alimony is only awarded if none of the other uh, forms of alimony are suitable. The purpose is to provide economic assistance for a short period. And this is where it gets very technical. And again, the Florida Board Bar Examiners are emphasizing it because they want to know and they want to make sure that you know these percentages and these numbers. So 
what I really want you guys to harp in on, if you get an essay on family law and you're discussing alimony, is the duration of the marriage. It's an important factor in determining the duration of alimony as a time period for receiving this alimony. So what does that mean? It cannot exceed 50% of the length of a short-term marriage, can exceed 60% of the length of a moderate-term marriage, and it cannot exceed 75% of the length of a long-term marriage. So really know these percentages, 50, 60, 75, be able to spit them out cold because that's what they're going to be looking for, that you know these distinctions. And another important thing with the numbers, it's not available for marriages that are less than three years in length. And the length of the award cannot be modified unless there are exceptional circumstances, which is kind of going to be your default. You're going to see this trend for these areas that absent there being a change in circumstances, usually, you know, things are not going to be changed or not going to be disturbed. So make sure that you know the ones that can be modified and the ones that can't. And then, of course, right, you can award several of these. Doesn't necessarily have to be one. They can award two of them. Um, the biggest thing that I want you to harp on in these essays is you really want to show the Florida Board Bar Examiners that you know all of these. So even if in your head you've already made a determination like, oh, nope, looks to me like they're only going to be awarded pendente lite, I want you to go ahead and address all of the four that are available and, of course, tell them that Florida has abolished permanent alimony. So you want to discuss all of these in an essay, um, you know, and then you argue both. Argue both sides. On this hand, this party is going to argue that they're entitled to this. On the other hand, the other party is going to say this. And again, sprinkle in the need and the ability of the parties uh, for the access to the alimony, all right? Um, so yeah, the court can award a combination of these types of alimony and or a lump sum, meaning they can issue a payment and just say, here you go, we're gonna take care of it with this lump sum money. And again, that's at the discretion of the court and based upon the party's arguments and the factors that they weigh in at the beginning. All right, so modification of support, a party seeking a modification of alimony must establish, and these are the key words that you want to sprinkle on the S. Oh. Sorry, I mean, I don't know. Did you answer okay. Alexis' question? The clarification? I... Sorry. Sorry. Oh, wait. Let me respect. check. You said to ask for a modification if one of them gets remarried. Can you ask for this modification, though, if you have it notified as not able to be modified? I'm assuming no, but so then the person is stuck paying their ex-spouse even if they are remarried. Correct. Yes. Um, Eric, um, Alexa, you are on the right track. So let me just reread your question. So to clarify off of Erica's question, you said to ask for modification. If one of them gets remarried, you can ask for this modification. Okay. Yeah. So depending on, and again, depending on the type of alimony that has been awarded. So if it, if it's a pendente elite and they, and they get remarried, but they're still pending, um, you know, they get remarried in that situation, they can go ahead and modify it, right? But if it's bridged the gap, again, you know, can't be modified. It is what it is. So in this, in, in those situations, those specific types of alimonies that can't be modified, even if they do get remarried, it won't be able to be modified. They won't disrupt the judge's findings on that. Nice. Does perfect. that clarify the question? Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, just make sure the ones that can be modified and can be modified, what I would say that helps out is make a chart and that way you can see which ones are able to be modified and those that are not. All right, so again, for the alimonies that are able to be modified, what you wanna sprinkle in is that there's a substantial marital change in the circumstances that was not contemplated when alimony was awarded and is sufficient material and involuntary and permanent in nature. Okay, so what are examples of that? There's a death of either spouse, right? In that situation, there is not going to be the ability for the other individual to pay. There's remarriage, not, although not automatic for rehabilitative. Um, so in that situation, I apologize. Sorry, you want so in that situation, right? Um, you want to really check to see which are the ones that are going to be able to be uh, changed, all right? Uh, so sprinkling those words, substantial material change in circumstances that was not contemplated when animally was awarded, 
and it's sufficient material and involuntary and permanent in nature. Those are the key words that you want to buzz in there when you do see the ones that can be modified. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and look at a quick typo. So let's just say that husband, he's 50 years old and he works at a fast food restaurant and he's making $25,000 per year. Wife is a lawyer and she earns $175,000 per year. The marriage is 15 years. So um, in that situation, what do we think? Do we think that pendente lite will be awarded if they're throughout the divorce proceedings? I would say probably yes, right? And what about, let's look, let's take a look at how old he is. He's 50, he's 50 years old in the situation. He works at a fast food restaurant, he's making 25,000. He probably needs some help transitioning from being uh, married into single. So will they do bridge the gap? Probably because he has the need for him to transition into being single. And durational animal, it may be available. And again, we just want to look at the circumstances of the party, the earning, the income, the age of the party, and what they're doing. All right, so we want to take, uh, have the focus on that. So any questions so far with alimony before we transition into time sharing? Well, um, someone sent me a message about Florida Statute 61.14. Um, Angie, do you mind sending that to the entire group? Our resident researcher. And this is good. I like having uh, moments like this. Here, maybe I can copy and paste it. Um, you said that to me again. Okay, yeah. So um, the court must modify or terminate an alimony award upon a paying party proving the recipient party has entered into a supportive relationship as defined by Florida Statute 61.14. So I think that's what Erica was alluding to, that if they enter into a new um, marriage, then they could... Either, the court has to either modify it or eliminate it. Like it's a factor in um, modification. Is that what you're talking about, Angie? I mean, I don't know if she has her, her thing on, but you do you agree with that, Emily? Yes, I do agree with that. That's certainly one of the factors that the court will look into the, you know, the remarriage. And again, that goes back to the need and the ability of the, of the individual that is asking for the, for the alimony in that situation. That's correct. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions? And, and you know, and again, the best way to get familiar with family law is look at that. Look at that chapter sixty-one. That's really going to help you be familiar with the language and get more comfortable with that. And the more words, the more buzzwords you can throw in those essays, and the more knowledge you have, you know, the more points you're going to get from the Florida Board of Law Examiners for sure. Perfect. Okay. All right. So um, let's move on to time sharing and parental responsibilities. So uh, biggest thing is we don't want to use the word uh, child custody. I know that it, it's very like, um, we want to say child custody because it sounds so familiar, but in Florida, okay. make sure that we say time sharing, okay? So uh, this only comes up if the they have children. So what does that mean? If there's no children that are involved, you're not going to go ahead and even address this. Don't waste your time talking about time sharing if no children exist. And kind of have how we have seen throughout uh, throughout today's lecture, the theme is the best interest of the child. That's the standard. So for all matters that are related to parenting and time sharing and support and child support, the theme is gonna be the best interest of the child. So when in doubt, just put the best interest of the child. So in this situation, when the courts are making the time sharing plan, they're going to look to see also the capacity and the ability of the parents. There's going to be several factors that the court will look at when they're making this comprehensive plan. And some of those factors include each parent's ability to provide a stable home environment. And again, what I, when, when I want you, when I, when we say ability, we don't want to think about not only like the mental capacity, but also the physical ability of these parents or the parents to be able to provide a stable home environment? Do they have the physical and mental ability to provide a stable home for the children? So the court will also consider the child's preference, especially if they're older children. So who do they prefer to stay longer with? They'll take that into consideration. And again, these aren't elements, these are factors. So it's kind of, again, uh, a balancing test where the court will look to see and weigh all these factors. So the parent's willingness to allow and facilitate 
time sharing. So what does that mean? If you have, um, if you have husband who doesn't want to share time with the children, he just wants to keep them all the time, or he doesn't want to drop them off at mom's house, right? The court's going to look at that. The husband's willing, uh, the ex husband's willingness to allow and facilitate the, the time sharing. Are, are they going to make efforts to make sure that the other parent is having the time with the child as well? So essentially what I want you to keep in mind is the court wants both parents to be involved in raising the child. The court's not going to give automatic preference to the primary custody to the mother or the father. It's not granted just because they're, they have primary custody of the child. They're going to go ahead and see, you know, how can both parents be involved in the upbringing of their child? And the focus is going to be, again, on the best interest of the child. So what does that mean, right? If you have, um, let's just say, wife who doesn't do homework, she's not the primary, uh, she's not the primary custody to the child, but she never does homework with the kid, doesn't take the child to um, doctor's visits, is not involved in making any of these decisions, doesn't feed the kids, right? Or um, about to be evicted. These are all factors that the court's going to look at in determining, okay, is this an individual in which we want them to be present a part of the child's life? The court's probably not going to give her zero time, but they're just going to go ahead and allocate, right, the responsibilities. Maybe she's not going to be the one involved in taking the child to the doctor. We'll put it with dad. So they're kind of going to go ahead and look to see who is best equipped to make these decisions for the child, right? So again, no automatic preference for giving primary custody to the mother or the father. They're just going to go ahead and weigh these factors. So it's important to note that a parent may forfeit the right to shared responsibility by engaging in conduct that injuriously affects the child's welfare, welfare or morals. So it's very fact specific. The biggest thing is with any essay that you read in the floor in um, the bar exam is you want to see if the facts tell you right? Facts are not telling you anything about this. Don't hypothetically make it up. Make sure that the facts discuss it. They're going to make it very obvious. And, you know, again, use your common sense. If it's something that looks like they shouldn't be doing it, then you probably want to address it because no fact is given to you in the Florida, in the Florida essays without you having to address it for some reason. And again, it's rare that a parent will have no right to shared responsibility. And the theme is because of the best interest of the child, and we want to make sure that both parents are involved in raising that child. Okay, so what does a parenting plan do? Essentially, what it does is it outlines the legal decisions made for the child. This plan is submitted to the court and it outlines the decision that they will make. Meaning, what does that include? The responsibility for the daily tasks associated with the child and how such responsibility will be shared between the parents. Time sharing schedules. The methods that each party will use to communicate with the child. Meaning, is there an app? Are they going to be able to call them at a certain time? Are they going to go ahead and be able to email them at a certain time? And the responsibility for communication about and completion of forms relating to health, education, and other activities. Pretty much what I want you to think about, it's a robust plan that's indicating, you know, um, husband, uh, former husband and wife, you guys are going to be in charge of this. And it's just pretty much to give a balance to the child and have a good upbringing for them. And that also includes third parties, right? There could be individuals that are included in the time sharing plan. For example, an aunt, an uncle, grandma, someone who's going to have some sort of influence in the time sharing, the parental responsibilities. So we want to make sure not only is it just typical mom and dad, right? But we want to also look at third parties that are involved that might have custody of the child and, um, and how they will come into play with the upbringing of the child for the parental responsibility. So I'm a big believer if, if you don't understand something, go straight to the statute. You guys can always go to 61, uh, chapter 61.13. And again, it's going to give you these 20 factors that are pretty much are going to outline what the court looks at. And, you know, as you can see here, right, the demonstrated capacity and disposition of each parent to facilitate. I'm not going to go through each and every single one of these. But, you know, again, it, it focuses on the capacity and disposition of each parent to determine, consider, and act upon the needs of the child, opposed to the needs or desires of the parent, um, the moral fitness of the parents, the mental and physical health of the parents, which is what we were talking about earlier, right? It's not just, what if they're disabled, they can't, they can't get up, they can't move, 
you know, those types of things. And you would always argue both. On one hand, this party is going to argue that, yes, they might have this physical disability, but they've lived with it for, I don't know, 20 years, right? So they're still able to perform their duties. On the other hand, this party will argue this. And then you conclude, right? Whether your conclusion is right or wrong, you always want to make sure to conclude in these essays. <clears throat> so if you guys want to check out uh, chapter 61, you can uh, read it. Look to see the factors that the court considers in uh, composing this parenting plan. And again, a parenting plan is statutorily defined as a document created to govern the relationship between the parents relating to decisions that must be made regarding the minor child. In creating the plan, all circumstances between the parties, including their historic relationship, right? So who are they with? Um, who, like, let's just say boyfriend. If boyfriend is not a good influence on the child and you're with him all the time, you're living with him, the court's certainly going to look at that. Um, domestic violence, right? What's what? Is there any domestic violence that's present or was present? And other factors may be taken into consideration. Meaning, again, in these in these essays, if they tell you certain things like uh, what my administration or me and Miriam took it, the parents were in jail, or one of the parents was in jail, had a history of um, had to go to rehab, all these things. These are things that you, that are not just put there for any reason. You want to bring it up and you want to let them know, hey, I know these factors and the court is certainly going to weigh this in when they're coming up with the time sharing plan. So um, biggest thing is the court can approve a parenting plan developed and agreed by the parents. Right. So let's just say that the parents are like, nope, we have it all squared away. Here's our plan. And we have every single minute of my child's day outlined. And um, I'm going to take care of taking my child to school and um uh, they're going to take care of taking them to the doctor or taking them to ballet practice, right? The court will consider that, but the court also has discretion not to approve such a plan and instead develop its own. And we can see that in uh, chapter 61.046. So the court will say, yes, they can consider it. Who knows? Maybe they'll accept it. But again, the court always has discretion and they will operate under the assumption of it's in the best interest of the child. So um, again, can be modifications to a previously ordered plan, but a modification is not permitted without a showing, and these are the buzzwords that you want to throw in for modifications without a substantial, material, and unanticipated change in circumstances and a determination that the modification is in the best interest of the child. That's exactly what you want to put if um, you're seeing that one party is seeking to do a modification to a time-sharing plan that's what you want to address and you want to tie that in with the facts as to why it's substantial and it's material and it's unanticipated. Um, so it's definitely buzzwords that you want to throw into your essay. Okay. Um, any questions so far for time sharing? Let me just check the chat. All right. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about relocation. So in what happens if, for example, um, one of the parties wants to go ahead and take the kid, or there's a fear that one of the parties is going to just remove the child from the state? If that happens and there's a risk and the court determines that, the court can impose restrictions on travel. What do those restrictions look like? They'll probably tell, um, they'll require the surrender of the child's, uh, the child's passport. They'll require the posting of a bond or other security restrict the ability of the parent to take the child to a country that is not part of the Hague Convention unless the written agreement has been received from the other parent or order that the child not be removed from the state or country without the express notarized permission of both parents or by a court order. And again, these are things that the court can do um, and this will only be triggered if again, you see that in the fact pattern, there's one parent that's trying to remove them from the state take them to another country, um, take them to uh, New York, for example, that should trigger in your head as an issue. And then at that situation, in that point in time is when you'll tell Lord Board Bar examiners on your essay, hey, this is what the court can do. They can impose these restrictions. And if it's not followed through, then guess what? They're in violation, right? So <clears throat> what I want you guys to think about relocation is, again, numbers is really big in this in, in, on these exams, right? A custodial parent can relocate up to 49 miles from their current residence without violating the shared parental responsibility. 
And that just essentially means is that if it's 40, if it's up to 49 miles and they'll make it very obvious that it is within that uh, mile range, then they don't need permission from the court or the other parent. You don't need the consent and you don't need to tell the, you don't need to seek a petition for, uh, with, for modification with the court. So it may be within the state of Florida or across the state border. The key number that you want to see is that it is within the 49 miles, right? So if it's under 50, you're good. If you're not, then that's when we start getting issues. And that's where it's your job to go ahead and identify those issues and address it on your essay. So if the parent wishes to relocate 50 miles or more, so if you're seeing on the fact pattern that they're telling you they want to relocate for 65 miles, that should be triggering an issue in your head that something's wrong. If they have this time sharing plan and they're wishing to relocate, then that's where it's your job to go ahead and identify that there's going to be an issue with that as to relocation of the child. So what's important is that you address also who bears the burden of proof. In that situation where the individual is seeking to move, the parent seeking to move, they're going to bear the burden of proof. And you must say that in your essay. So if you're seeing that it's 50 miles or more, the parent that's moving is the one who bears the burden of proof. All right. Um, what's important to know is that it can't be a temporary absence. What does that mean? You can't go, uh, let's just say, two weeks on vacation and then you're coming back. Right. That's temporary. That's not really permanent. Uh, so it has to be more than 60 days. And again, numbers. They love numbers. More than 60 days. Uh, that it has to be for relocation. So what can they do in that situation to be able to get that granted, that move? Well, they have to get written consent of every person entitled to a time sharing is required. So back to what we were saying, generally it's going to be the parents that are in this time sharing plan, but there can also be a third party, grandma, uncle, someone else who's involved in time sharing. That individual also has to consent to it if that's the method in which they're going to go ahead and seek to have it approved. Right. So that's the first way that they can get it approved that they're moving 50 miles or more. They're relocating. The second way or is to serve a petition to relocate of every person entitled to a time sharing. The petition must, it's not may, so it's not discretionary. It must include details about the move, the date in which they anticipate to move, the location and the reason. So what's the reason? Maybe it could be they got a new job. And they're going to be making double their salary. Well, the court's going to look at that. Is that going to help the life of the child and provide them with a better life? Probably yes. So the court's certainly going to weigh in to see what is the reason for the move? When are they moving? So right, when is the anticipated date for that? And where exactly are they moving? And it also must include a proposed revision plan for timesharing and transportation, meaning how are we going to amend this time sharing plan to make it feasible for all the parties? And again, make it in the best interest of the child. So, and not only that, but if they're moving to, let's just say, for example, New York, how is the child going to be transported? Are they going to go through a plane? Who are they going to go with? Are they going to go on a train? How are they going to get here? Are you going to bring them down personally? The court just wants to have the exact details for there to be no confusion as to what's going to happen. And again, this ties back to the best interest of the child. The court will certainly weigh the factors to see is the move for the best interest of the child and they'll make that determination. So <clears throat> again, for relocation, there's no presumption in favor of one parent. The standard that you wanna think about is what is the best interest of the child? Um, even if time sharing will be substantially modified, there's still no presumption in favor of one parent or the other. They're just going to go ahead and go back to that standard. Um, the factors that the court considers is the involvement and relationship with parents, siblings, and others, and the feasibility of preserving those relationships. Um, the child's age, the needs, and the impact of the relocation. And when you're on these essays, argue both, right? Uh, people differ in their opinions. Just argue both hands, argue both. Say on this situation, they're probably going to say that they're not able to see their siblings anymore or the child's too small or you can take the opposite approach. So just always present both arguments to, uh, on your essays and then conclude. I can't emphasize that enough. So uh, there's, gonna, there's this thing that's called the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act. The acronym is UCCJEA. 
essentially what this is, it was an act in Florida and it governs interstate child custody disputes and determines which state has jurisdiction in the case. So uh, to make this short and sweet, you're only gonna see this issue if you see that there is two states, right? And the law is implicated when a custodial parent leaves the state of Florida, for example, and there's a minor, minor child, they go to New York and uh, they want New York to go ahead and change the time sharing plan. So the hypo down here is the original shared parental responsibility order was entered in Miami, Florida. Dad moves to New York and brings a child. Dad wants to modify the order to change the time sharing rules. This must be heard in Miami, Florida and the New York court cannot modify the order. That's why they just simply don't have jurisdiction. So when do you address this? You have multiple states that are involved. The child's home state where the child has resided for the six months has what's called continuing jurisdiction. And that's a buzzword that you wanna throw in there, uh, continuing jurisdiction, all right? Okay, so before we get into child support, is there um, any questions so far on uh, time sharing? or on relocation. All right. <clears throat> so child support. Uh, again, we're throwing in those buzzwords that they want to hear. Child support cannot be waived in marital agreement. And it's like Miriam said earlier, this right belongs to the child, does not belong to the parents. So what does that mean? If you see a prenuptial agreement, they're getting into a contract and they're saying, oh, Child support is waived, uh, I'm not gonna pay child support. Too bad, too sad, the court's not gonna enforce that. Child support cannot be waived in a marital agreement. This right belongs to the child. And that's a sentence that you want to be in there. And again, there's no children, you should not be discussing child support. You're only gonna be a dis a discussing time sharing and child support if you see that there's children involved. If the facts don't tell you, you don't address it. They're gonna make it very clear, there's children involved. So essentially, uh, other buzzwords, both parents have a duty to provide support until the child reaches the age of 18, unless, right, mental or physical reliance on it, meaning past the age of 18, but they need it, right? There's a mental reason why, or there's a physical reliance on the child support as to why they need it, or the child is 19 years old and still in high school, okay? So if you see any of these things, until when do they have the duty to pay child support? They're 18 they have mental or physical reliance on it, or they're 19 and still in high school, we're gonna say that the parents still have a duty to provide child support, all right? Uh, generally, the non-custodial parent must pay the child for the benefit of the custodial parent. So Florida, it, there's strict statutory support guidelines on this. Uh, Florida has adopted child support guidelines to determine the amount of a child support award. There's a, there's a chart, I'm sure you guys don't want to, you know, spend time looking at it, but if you guys have time, there's a chart that indicates, you know, the, the amounts that are going to be awarded for child support. So what I do want you to address is that guidelines are based on an income sharing model. The child should receive the same proportion of parental income as if the parties had continued to live together. So essentially is, you know, we want to think back to the public policy consideration as to why child support is there. We want to give the child the best life possible. And again, it goes back to the best interest of the child. So how do you calculate the child support, right? They're gonna add up each parent's net income together. The court determines the correlating support amount set forth in the statutory chart, which if you guys have time, you can look at it. And the statutory amount is then allocated to each parent based on the parent's respective income. Now, what is really important, and um, this is, I, I want you guys to put on the essay, you guys get family law essay and it's talking about child support is, the discretion that the court has. There are these statutory guidelines that must be abided by, but the court has discretion to deviate, right? 5% up or down from the guideline amount. So if the court goes beyond that 5% that's allowed, the buzzwords that I want you to put is, and the more, the, the, it, then the court must set forth specific findings explaining and supporting the deviation. All right, so again, very technical with these numbers as we've seen throughout it, right? Uh, more than 5%, then we're gonna make sure that the court has to put the specific findings and explaining why they're deviating from those statutory guidelines. So how do you say that in an essay? The court referred to a statutory scale and performed the applicable calculation based on income and need. Departure from the guidelines of more than 5% requires written findings and justification. 
keep it simple, right? Just let them know that you know what you're talking about. Put that in an essay and you'll be fine. So adoption. Um, I'm sure this is not the first time you guys have heard of adoption. You guys have probably heard about it in wills and trusts. You'll hear it again in family law. So essentially what adoption does is that it creates the relationship uh, of the person and the legally of the child and adoptive parents for every purpose. Um, you know, essentially under the, uh, under the eyes of the law, they are now treated as they were their biological child once they have been adopted. So what are the rights? Adopted child are entitled to all rights and subject to all obligations as if they were born to the parents in a lawful wedlock. And what does that include? You know, I'm sure you guys have heard about it in wills. That includes inheritance rights. So Florida recognizes adoptions from other jurisdictions. So if, um, you know, Sally was adopted in New York, the court, the court in Florida will, will uh, recognize that adoption is valid. So who can be adopted? And this is major because this was tested in the July administration of 2023. So any person, right, a minor or adult. So if someone is an adult, they can be adopted. They may be adopted. And that is something that they're going to make very obvious on that test. They're going to put a fact pattern where the individual is over the age of 18. So any person, which includes a minor or an adult, may be adopted. All adoptions of minor children require adoption agencies except for those by a relative or a step parent. And what does that look like? Grandma, right? Uncle, grandpa. If they're a relative, you're not going to need to go through that adoption agency. But if they're a minor, then you will. And now we want to focus on who can be an adoptive parent. So essentially a married couple, a married individual or an unmarried adult, persons with disability may adopt um, unless the disability renders the person incapable of serving as an effective parent. And we kind of saw that trend earlier, right? With the capacity of, of a parent and the time sharing plan to make those decisions or what role they're going to take on. So that's kind of the trend. You're going to see the need, the ability, the capacity of the parties to do their role in the child's life. So the Department of Children and Families, DCF, must complete and file a report as to suitability of the prospective adoptive home. Meaning DCF kind of has to have that final stamp of approval as to whether this individual or couple that's seeking to adopt the child or the adult is fit to be in the life of that child and they're able to provide, you know, the best interest of the child. So the D, you know, DCF will go ahead and kind of provide that final stamp of approval. So <clears throat> you'll also see situations in which uh, one parent might not be fit and there's gonna be a termination of parental rights. So the termination of parental rights pending adoption is required, meaning they have to kind of essentially let the other individuals know that their rights as parents are terminated. And they have to give them notice and the opportunity to be heard. And you're going to kind of see that trend because it falls under the due process, right? So in order for their parental rights to be terminated, there must be a petition uh, for termination of parental rights. It has to be filed by a parent or person having physical custody of the minor. It must be served on any person whose consent to the adoption is required. And again, we're giving them that notice. And the person required to, to consent includes the mother, the father, and the minor if they're at least 12 years of age, unless the court does not require it. So anyone lawfully entitled to the custody of the minor and sometimes the court. And essentially, we're just giving them that notice and the opportunity to be heard, right? Because they're taking away something and that's their ability to have their parental rights, which is a big deal. So the petition to terminate the parental rights together with a summons must be served on any person whose consent to the adoption is required, unless the person waives service. And again, I want you to just think due process, right? So there's gonna be some times where you'll see that there's voluntary termination, and that's essentially where the biological parents are consenting to giving up their rights. And the facts are gonna be very clear. They're gonna tell you the, par the parent consented, they agreed to um, the child being adopted, right? Or you'll see a situation in which the adult themselves consents to being adopted. So you wanna you know, be very vigilant for those facts that they're gonna throw your way. So what does it look like in an involuntary termination of parental rights? It may be initiated by the state if required, is required in order to proceed with adoption unless the parties pursue voluntary uh, termination of parental rights. So after termination, 
a parent is no longer entitled to notice uh, her information about the child. So essentially, they lose their rights in that situation. Um, and that's pretty much family law in a nutshell. And I will um, turn it over to Marion to kind of wrap it up. But does anybody have any questions on uh, child support, adoption? And I'll check the chat. Okay, and I'll turn it over to Mary. Mary, do you want me to keep on sharing my screen or? Yeah, just, just keep on sharing it. I did want to mention um, me, Emily, and Andrew were kind of talking about something that we didn't mention in the PowerPoint today, um, but I want to go ahead and tell you guys. Um, and it has to do with the whole 50-mile uh, thing. So everything that Emily said was correct. Now, <laughs> if a parent um, is seeking to relocate 50 miles or more from the other parent, um, you know, where the child lives, that written authorization or court order still needs to happen. However, um, there is a new change in the law for a very specific scenario. So um, at the time that the time sharing plan um, and the parenting plan is entered, um, at that time, let's say that the parents of the child did live, you know, 50 miles or more um, away from each other, right? Um, and again, this is the very specific, specific scenario it relates to. Now, if one of the parents moves back, relocates um, within 50 miles of the other parent, that is going to be enough to modify so that's going to be considered a substantial and material change to modify the time sharing and parenting plan um again it's a really specific scenario um it's going to be initially when the time sharing and parenting plan was entered the parents lived more than 50 miles um, from each other and now one of the parents is moving back within a 50 mile range from that parent and they're going to be seeking to modify the time sharing or parenting plan um moving back within 50 miles of the other parent is going to be enough it's going to be a substantial and material change um, for the court to consider modifying and changing that initial time sharing and parenting plan. Um, and what that practically is going to mean is that that parent who's moving closer is going to be able to get more time um, with the child because they're closer. That's going to be a substantial and material change there. So we didn't include that in the PowerPoint, but definitely wanted to make sure that we got it out there um, because it is one of the new changes that happened in 2023. Um, so that's kind of all the substantive stuff that we had to go over. Um, those are really the highly, highly tested topics when it comes to family law. But I did want to give just a quick little explanation about how you should structure a family law essay. Um, and like I stated before, I think the most important thing to just straight off the bat, go ahead and address is the jurisdiction of the court when it comes to um, the residency requirement for the court to be able to preside over the divorce proceedings, right? So those are the rules that we talked about, the six-month residency requirement um, or the party's intent to make Florida their primary residence and the reasons for the absence, right? That's a really, really quick um, sentence or two that you can just use to start your essay. Um, you're also going to want to address any pre or post marital agreements in place. Um, and you can kind of just put that accordingly, right? If it's a pre marital Um, if it's a post-marital agreement, you might want to mention it later in the fact pattern. Um, but just going through um, how the subject is laid out, this is how you should think about structuring the essay. Um, next thing is obviously going to be divorce, and that's going to be um, really probably the meat of a family law essay, right? So you definitely want to mention the uh, Florida being a no-fault state, 
the grounds for divorce and determine whether it is uncontested or it is a contested divorce or there's some minor marital children in place um, and what the court can do, what avenues the court can take um, in either scenario. Kind of once you go through that, next thing you definitely want to mention right after you go through your divorce rules is equitable distribution of property. So you're going to want to mention the equitable distribution factors. What are we going to take into consideration um, when we're doing equitable distribution? What are the marital assets that are going to be taken into account? And what are non-marital assets, right? Again, it is very, very likely that if you have to talk about equitable di distribution, there's going to be at least one piece of property or two that it's going to be up in the air. Is it marital asset? Is it a non-marital asset, right? You have to make that determination. And remember active and passive appreciation, everything we learned about that today and how that could uh, make a non-marital property, at least partly a marital property. Um after you go through equitable distribution, you're going to go into alimony again, big ticket item, one of the, you know, kind of meatier parts of the essay. We're going to want to talk about what is alimony, right? Give your rule statement for alimony. What are the types of alimony? Um, you can just briefly mention what the types of alimony are, and you can briefly mention that Florida has abolished permanent alimony. Um, but really think about the scenario that you have at hand in your essay and what types of alimony are actually going to be available here. Those are the ones that you're going to want to expand on, right? Because those are the ones that you're going to have to make an analysis on. So not only are you going to talk about the types of alimony and kind of harp on the ones that are going to be relevant to your fact pattern, you're also going to mention the factors, right? The factors that we talked about to determine the amount of alimony and the type of alimony that can be awarded. Um, and then any modifications of alimony, if it is... Um, if it is at issue in the fact pattern, you're going to want to talk about that too. Um, once you get through all of that, you're going to go into all of the issues surrounding children. So again, that's parental responsibility, um, time sharing, child support. If there's any jurisdictional issues um, regarding the UCC JEA, you're going to kind of want to just address that right away, right? Who's going to have jurisdiction over these proceedings? Where's the home state? Um, does the child have any um any sort of contact with another state that's not the home state right you're going to want to mention all of these things from the get-go jurisdiction is kind of just an easy way to start um an essay anyway and one of the things that we for sure have to mention when we're talking about children it's always going to be at play is the best interest of the child standard and all of those factors um, shared parental responsibility standard as to uh, custody, uh, shared parenting plan and their factors, a time sharing plan as to visitation, and all the factors that we're going to take into consideration for child support. And of course, any modifications of any of these things. And then adoption is kind of, you know, I, I put it last, but obviously if you get an adoption essay, it's probably going to be completely about adoption. So we did the bar last year and there was an adoption scenario. And I don't think anybody was expecting that adoption scenario. Um, I think it's only been tested like two times in the past 20 years, I guess three now when we count last year. Um, adoption was super unexpected and everyone kind of freaked out. I freaked out. I don't even know how that was my highest scoring essay. It somehow was. Um, but that just goes to show you that even these minor things that you think that they're not going to test, it's worth putting the time in to just learn it so that if you can get it, you can at least defend yourself and you never know, it might be what you perform best on. Um, so if you do get an adoption essay, which is not likely, but if you do get it, really what you want to focus on is the termination of that prior parent-child relationship and the establishment of the new parent-child relationship. Um, so focus on those two things, look at the factors of the prior, look at the factors of the new one, and kind of just take it from there. Um, there's also some topics that we really didn't touch on. Emily, can you go to the next slide? 
So we didn't talk about these topics. It's only a few of them. And that's because they're not really tested when they do test family law. Um, but just make sure that you review them because, again, sometimes it's these minor things that pop up and you want to make sure that you know enough about it, that you can put those rules, you can make a good analysis. Um, so that's going to be termination of marriage by death or annulment, right? So not necessarily divorce, but sometimes a spouse dies. Sometimes you get your marriage annulled, right? Um, sometimes there's also marriages that are void, um, and there's marriages that are voidable. Know the difference between the two just in case it does come up. Um, again, it'll probably be a minor issue, some of these things. I don't think that they'll make a whole essay out of it. Um, but it's simple enough that you can learn the two or three rules associated with it and get those two or three points that can make the difference between you passing and not passing. Um, the simplified dissolution procedure in the county court. Um, so that's going to be a really specific scenario um, to kind of just get a quick divorce, right? Um, it's just a few factors you have to learn. The Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act. Again, just read it over, have a good understanding of it. Probably not going to be tested, but doesn't hurt to just read a paragraph um, just to be prepared. And then the safe haven relinquishment um, dealing with uh, newborn babies. Again, it's really just a sentence or two um, that you have to learn to be able to attack these issues. Should you, um, in the unlikely event, but should they be there, you're going to be ready to attack it. You're going to be able to get those points and get these things right. Um, so those are kind of just the more um, untested um, issues in family law, but doesn't hurt to review them. It won't take that much of your time to just know what it's about. Um, and that's kind of it for us. Um, if we go to the next slide, it has my contact information and Emily's contact information. Should you guys want to reach out? When I did the wills, um, a lot of people reached out and, and asked great questions and asked for materials. I'm always really, really happy to help um, with anything that you guys need, whether it be the topics that I present on, something else, general tips, whatever it is, um, I'm here for you. I love working for IBIS. So everyone here is always available for you. Same goes for Emily. And yeah, thanks for having us. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or, you know, just ask out loud, but you can always email us after whenever you want. Amazing. Thank you so much, Marion and Emily. One of the greatest presentations of all time. If you watch this, you should know everything about family law. And if you still need additional help, they're available for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So amazing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording.